you may not have realized it, but we've made it to the chapter that you've been waiting for. And that's because we're finally to the point that we can understand why NADH and FADH2 or QH2, those high energy electron transport molecules, why are they so packed with power? So in the electron transport chain, we get to see how it acts as a currency exchange counter. That is, the electrons from NADH and QH2 can transfer those electrons to members of the chain. And within the chain, the transport of electrons can be coupled to the synthesis of ATP. That ATP is synthesized via, you got it, ox. FOSS, right? So the coupling of electron transport to the phosphorylation of ATP is what we're going to get to see within the ETC. And man, is it an energetic process. I mean, this thing kicks butt <laughs> because what we're going to see here is that if you take a typical glucose molecule that is worth in um, gl glycolysis, it has been given off about one fifteenth of the total energy it's capable of. And so in ETC, this is where we really get to see like the bang for the buck from, like, from the glucose molecule. So a lot of energy is released in the process of coupling electron transfer to the synthesis of ATP. So several integral membrane enzyme complexes perform the coupled transfer of electrons from NADH and QH2 to oxygen. Now, there are a lot of members in between NADH and oxygen. There's a lot of little transfers, like bing, 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 through all these little, little complexes in between to finally get those electrons from NADH to oxygen or from QH2 to oxygen. And maybe you're thinking, well, why not just take those electrons straight off NADH and just transfer them right onto oxygen? Well, the answer is very much the same as it was when we thought about just throwing the jelly donut onto the burning fire. It would be an inefficient process because there wouldn't be small discrete steps in which the energy from that is released from that electron transfer could be harnessed. And that's the harnessing of that energy is what's really going to be key here. We need to be able to take little discrete steps of energy release and use those to harness a proton motive force. And then it's that proton motive force that can really be tapped into to make ATP. And so that's why it's important for these transfers to take place gradually. So let's situate ourselves and we're going to focus on the eukaryotic cell. We know that within bacteria, the electron transport chain, if they have it, is found on the membrane uh, of the cell itself. But within eukaryotic cells, the complex of the electron transport chain are found within the mitochondrion. And more specifically, they're found within the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. We'll see how uh, that um, organelle has made structural adaptations to allow for the function of that inner membrane in electron transport. So we've got these electron transport members in, inside of the inner mitochondrial membrane where they're going to play a huge role in making the mitochondrion what it's known for being the powerhouse of the cell. And here we have it, the cell. I have a great model of a eukaryotic cell, cliche features and all. And if we zoom on in to this eukaryotic cell model, we can find the powerhouses of the cell. So you'll see here sort of in their cliche structure, looking a little bit like these bean shaped organelles, we have the mitochondria. And if we were able to zoom in even further, and maybe I should do that for the vodka, zoom in even further and we start to see the Christy, the infoldings there, uh, the invaginations that we know increase the surface area and we can recognize that that will be the location of the electron transport chain. So now picture it that we zoom in even further and upon zooming in even further we begin to make out the details of the inner membrane of the mitochondrion and here is where this beautiful model that I have this feeling that Jordan may have worked on this model. I don't know if I'm remembering correctly or not. 
but this is an electron transport chain model that shows if we were to zoom in to the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, the complexes of the ETC and the pumping of protons utilizing the reducing power. So this model even shows that NADH getting delivered to complex one of the ETC and the resulting pumping of the protons from each one of the members of the ETC. And then, of course, we know that the uh, proton motive force would be established in this inner uh, mitochondrial membrane space, so the space in between the inner and the outer membrane. So if we look back at our, our uh, beautiful cell um, we can't really make out that space, but you can see, you know, there's that inner membrane and then it would be in between that inner membrane and the outer membrane in that little region that I can barely put my fingernail in. Let's go ahead then and begin by introducing, or I'm hoping, fingers crossed, reintroducing the mitochondrion. It is one sweet organelle, often referred to as the powerhouse of the cell, and really generally depicted as this bean-shaped organelle, although there are proteins that have one long sort of tubular organelle. So this is not always the shape of a mitochondrion, but within mammalian cells and certainly within our liver hepatocyte, um, this is definitely going to be the appearance, the rough appearance of a mitochondrion. Now let's start from the inside of this organelle and work our way out. The inside lumen of the organelle is called the matrix and the matrix is just packed full of proteins. We know why, right? We've already looked at the fact that the TCA cycle is turning uh, inside of the mitochondrial matrix. So all of the enzymes that are involved with the TCA cycle, right, as it turns within that matrix are going to, and that's a horrible depiction of the TCA, but um, all of those enzymes are going to contribute to the overall protein content within this lumen. Um, there's also also, the transition step, right, occurring inside of the matrix, and we know that that wicked large uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex is found there. But not only that, soon we are going to learn, and I'm, I'm pumped about this, but soon we are going to be talking about fat metabolism and all of the enzymes for beta oxidation is the process that that it is termed when fats are broken down. So all of those enzymes are also found in there. So that was a long way to say that, yeah, there are a lot of proteins inside of the matrix and it makes the consistency, if you will, um, if you picture yourself swimming through the matrix, boy, it is really jello-y. It's really gel-like. It's very viscous because of all of that protein that's found in there. Now let's work our way out and talk for just a minute um, about the inner membrane here and again packed full of protein um, so the inner mitochondrial membrane is going to be very rich in protein in fact if you were to look at a ratio of protein to lipid you would see that that ratio would be four to one so there's by far more protein across this membrane than there is lipid. That's really um, interesting, isn't it? And it tells you something about function. In fact, particularly, I suppose it tells you that yes, indeed, the components of the electron transport chain span the inner mitochondrial membrane. So in fact, those four important components that make up the ETC, um, and boy, there will be many copies of these complexes. One, two, three, and four, the members of our, our ETC, boy, there can be multiple copies all along this inner mitochondrial membrane. And it's not just components of the ETC that span that membrane either. Remember how pyruvate had to get transported into the matrix? And um, there's other transporters like the malate transporter. We're going to look at those. And, and so there are transporters that span this as well. That's why this has such a, an amazingly high protein content um, across that membrane. Now we could also um, mention, I suppose, 
that the folding, the infoldings that you see there, which many of you will remember to be called Christi, these Christi actually um, are going to help to expand the surface area that can be littered with the com complexes of the ETC. So by having really these extensive infoldings uh, called the Christi, this actually leads to more room for more components of the ETC and more transporters and more protein in general. Um, so this is very important function of the Christi. And you know, it's interesting to note too that it's not just um, it's it's not always just shaped this way. In fact, in fungal cells, you'll see Christi being shaped more like plates. So it depends upon again the system that you're looking at how those Christi are shaped. But it, this is sort of the infoldings and invaginations is really kind of what we see within our mammalian cells, within our liver cell, for example. So these greatly increase the surface area, making room for more complexes. Now, like uh, like any plasma membrane um, that that we have talked about on the outside of a cell, the inner mitochondrial membrane is also very exclusive. Um, it's semi-permeable, only allowing in molecules with low molecular weight or hydrophobic, and then having transporters for those more polar substances or charged substances that might need to, to get across that inner membrane. And we've already talked about how this can sometimes present a problem, right? right? Because it's not freely permeable to NADA. So that cytosolic NADH that's formed uh, within glycolysis just can't readily transport across there and, and it, there is no transporter for it. So that can sometimes create a little bit of difficulty in getting that reducing power into the matrix to be used by the ETC. Now, I want to then work our way out again um, and note that this space right here is called the inner membrane space. And in fact, the inner membrane space is an extremely important location because as NADH reducing power is transferred to complexes 1 through 4 of the ETC, the ETC is going to convert, and remember we talked about this is all about energy conversion, right? So as these electrons are transferred through these complexes, what we see is that the power from the electrons is actually harnessed in the form of a proton motive force or a proton gradient and that proton gradient forms in the inner membrane space. So we're going to see the inner membrane space being a very important location um, because this is going to be the location where the PMF or proton motive force forms. Awesome. Um, so we could say then that the um, next level of our structure of the mitochondrion that we might want to look at is actually the outer membrane. The outer membrane is much more permeable than the inner membrane is. The outer membrane is actually filled with porin proteins. And remember how we learned that those are present in bacterial membranes, outer membranes. Um, and in fact, this is of note because this gives a great deal of credence to the idea of the endosymbiont origins of the mitochondrion. That is, that it is um, fairly well accepted that the mitochondrion evolved from a bacterial ancestor. And the idea that the outer membrane is typified by the same sort of proteins as is a bacterial outer membrane gives further credence to that theory. So it has only a few type of proteins, but porins are one of the important types there. Now that can allow for transport of, of molecules of less than 10,000 Daltons, which is a large number of molecules ranging from sugars, um, you know, and, and uh, disaccharides and things like that to amino acids and whatnot that can just simply uh, very easily transfer in those pores that uh, span that membrane. So not very exclusive. Um, it's like the, what it's like the party house, everybody come on in, right? <laughs> not really too exclusive. Okay, cool. Now let's just mention a couple other things about mitochondria in general. Um, the average size of a mammalian mitochondrion, like the one that you might see see within a liver cell is somewhere on the order of about 0.2 to 0.8 micrometers by about 0.5 to 1.5 micrometers.
Now some of you guys will recognize those dimensions as being really quite quite familiar to you. Um, in fact, if you think about a bacterial cell, bacterial, many bacterial cells are around that size. So this size is, is actually fairly uh, supportive, again, of the endosymbiont theory of origin for the mitochondrion. Now, the, the, the number, let me ask you a question, the number of mitochondria within a cell varies greatly between species and cell types. The question is why? Okay, now this is going to sound funny, but I always think about Crocodile Dundee when I ask this question, <laughs> um, because I, I actually think about the muscle tissue that allows, say, an alligator, um, or I think a crocodile as well, to snap its jaw shut very rapidly, right? It can snap its jaw shut just like with a, a massive amount of strength and, and rapidity. Um, it's just amazing but it can't do it multiple times. So what that means is that it's using largely anaerobic metabolism to fuel a very quick burst of energy. But it doesn't have, the muscle tissue in the jaw of the alligator doesn't have very many mitochondria. Okay, let's think that through. So mitochondria are the site of the TCA the transition step and the ETC, right? And this is this is the location of what we might think of as aerobic metabolism, right? Um, anaerobic is glycolysis and conversion to lactate, right? Lactate is considered the byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. And aerobic metabolism, remember, the TCA only runs, the, the transition step only runs when the ETC has a terminal electron acceptor. And we know that within mammalian systems, that terminal electron acceptor is oxygen. So only when oxygen is present and can be reduced to water can the anything in the mitochondrion go. So the mitochondrion represents aerobic metabolism. This has a great deal of practical Im implication for all of you, really, but nobody more so than those of you who said you loved birds. And I know some of you said that if you could choose an animal, you would be a bird. I think Galen wanted to be a raptor of some sort, and Elisa chose a hummingbird. And those are perfect examples of the uh, representing the nuances of mitochondrial density in muscle tissue. So if you think about a hummingbird, or in fact, I was just uh, leafing through my free wildlife, um, World Wildlife Fund calendar, and I found the, the puffin in here as well, which along those lines, both the hummingbird and the puffin beat their wings extremely rapidly for extremely long distances. And so when you think about powering the needs of that rapid motion for a long period of time, they're going to need to have a high mitochondrial density in, in many of their tissues in order to support extended fuel needs over long periods of time. So in fact, this, this also applies when we think about our Thanksgiving dinner. Right. If we think about the difference between the types of meat that we eat, and people are really particular about that, aren't they? So you can think about the difference between the white meat and the dark meat. The white meat is going to have a very low mitochondrial density, low myoglobin concentration, low ability to uh, satisfy energy needs using aerobic respiration, uh, low density of the components of the electron transport chain. Whereas the dark meat, the dark meat is the long last slow twitch fibers. The dark meat is rich in mitochondria, rich in electron transport chain components, rich in myoglobin, right? Because we know myoglobin is delivering the oxygen that's the terminal electron acceptor for the electron transport chain. So these are aerobic tissues and that pertains to us too, right? We have muscle tissues that, especially in those of us who are long distance athletes, we work hard hard to hone our aerobic capacity. That is, um, the long distance athlete 
is known for their type 2 slow twitch or their type 1 slow twitch muscle fibers, whereas they're less known for their type 2 uh, fast twitch fibers that are more of white meat. They have lower mitochondrial, lower my myoglobin, uh, lower aerobic respiration, lower levels of ox FOSS, right, going on. So that pertains when we think back to our Olympic athletes getting prepped for the upcoming games as well. We have some that have m m uh, honed a more a higher type 1 slow twitch, a uh, high mitochondrial level in, in their tissues than others. <laughs>